Hey everyone, Clarence with Spencer's Camera here. This is part two of a editing, uh, astrophotography <clears throat> editing series uh, that we're doing. A pretty basic series. We wanted to keep it pretty uh, entry level, uh, more basic editing kind of tips um, for this sequence. And then we'll move into more advanced <clears throat> types of editing uh, tutorials. Um, but for this case, uh, the first video we covered earlier, about a 15 minute video, basically showed some rough uh, initial edits that uh, I prefer to make <coughs> for a nightscape type image. Uh, and again, nightscape is something that's a nighttime image that has a landscape in it uh, included in that. So typically that's with the Milky Way or uh, you're seeing a lot more nowadays with <clears throat> um, other nighttime uh, night sky objects in the in the sky, you know the Orion complex or Andromeda galaxy, other things like that, uh, including included with a foreground. But uh, for nightscape editing, um, it's very important to um, <clears throat> get an accurate selection of the foreground or the sky. Let's say the sky and that's what we'll cover today is how to make a good accurate selection in this video. Um, but before I do so, <clears throat> in the, and I apologize, my little clearing my throat, uh, in the earlier video I, we, I failed to cover some basic settings that I prefer to use in Camera Raw. Um, down in the bottom of the Camera Raw window there's this little section um, that shows the um, a couple of settings. If you click that, it will open the Camera Raw Preferences dialog box. Under the left-hand column, uh, it'll open up to Workflow. If it's not, then click on Workflow. And then within this color space area, <clears throat> you want to make sure you pick under Space Pro Photo RGB. Then also in Depth, you want to select 16 bits. Um, this will enable you to capture or sorry to um, retain all or the maximum amount of color variants uh, in your file as long as you're shooting in raw and using a raw file to edit as we are here uh, your color variations will be um, well just a lot almost infinite but uh, basically you you won't have any issues with colors clipping off and or anything like that um, but just click OK here now from the last video this is where we ended off some basic color temperature adjustments um, and uh, underneath the basic tab a little S curve very subtle S curve as before in detail um, we went in and reduced some noise a little bit there um, and actually, we really shouldn't do any sharpening, so I forgot that, so we'll lower that down to zero. Um, and then in the optics, we corrected just a hint of a vignette that was on, uh, in the image <clears throat> initially in, in an edit. And also, we um, defringed at, at one on both green and purple under the defringing areas. Um, Initial, in my initial edits, I usually try to remove any vignetting from the picture um, just because um, <clears throat> it, it uh, well, there's reasons for it. And mainly, I don't want the corners to get too dark later as we stretch things farther. Um, and if you remove the vignette now, then that solves future problems um, that, that could arise depending on how far we stretch things and push things in, in the edit. Um, so I prefer to do that. Um, also, you can add the vignette back to the file or to the image if it's a pleasing aspect to, to add, a pleasing addition to the image. So, but I, initially I try to take out as much of the vignette as I can, um, and th then we can add it back later if we decide to. It just can can create can create issues <clears throat> during the editing process. So. Basically, we did those edits earlier. We just we're just going to click open. There are other options within Camera Raw function: open or open as a smart object or open as a copy. I just click open. It'll now read the file and apply those basic edits to it and open it up. <clears throat> now, 
And I apologize, my computers are a little bit slow because there's so many <clears throat> um, items running in the background, the uh, video capture program and audio programs, things like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I always open up this window as big as I can because I'm going to eventually be zooming in tight to, and moving it around a lot, and I like to have a big work, workspace. Uh, another setting I prefer in Photoshop is up here under Edit and Preferences, and then I go to Performance. <clears throat> I want to make sure this history states over here is at the maximum amount possible. So the default is 50. I crank that up to, to 1,000, which is the maximum, and then I click OK. The reason I do that, there's a lot of other uh, preferences that I set as well, but um, again, this is a fairly basic tutorial series we're doing. I prefer that so that the history uh, tab <clears throat> in Photoshop will retain as much information historically, any minor edits, every little thing we do will be retained um, in a historical layout so I can go back in history to see and verify that the things I'm doing, I can click, okay, well, you know, 300 clicks ago, this is what it looked like compared to now after I've done some edits, does it look right? I like that flexibility. If it's only at 50, then you lose that flexibility, some of that flexibility. Okay, so uh, enough of that stuff. Let's just jump in here and make a quick selection. The easiest way to select this for me that's, that's still a, a high quality way of selecting is you just click the um, the uh, quick selection tool or press W that will open this up it's going to be a plus symbol you can increase that brush size pretty good and then just brush over the sky and it should pretty much select the entire sky um, if it doesn't you can use the minus or plus to, to add or subtract from the selection but you don't you don't need to worry about it being very close at all or very accurate at this point we're going to refine that edge shortly but I want to zoom in to this area <clears throat> with the reflection bring the brush size down a little bit and then I'll just kind of gradually uh, paint in some of these areas and um, Photoshop will will think its way through a very rough selection and it's okay if these lily pads uh, these lily pads it had gotten cold and frozen one night a couple of nights and so these lily pads are curled up a little um, and that's okay if it doesn't select those perfectly because we're going to come back into that um, now it's done a very rough selection and that's adequate at this point then up here at the top the select and mask click that that will open the select and mask dialog window um, which then if you click color here and tell it what color you want, I prefer the red, it will show you what has not been selected. Um, and you can increase or reduce the opacity of that red. I like to be able to see through it a little bit, so about 50% is where I leave it. And I can see what um, has been selected behind it, what hasn't been, just on these uh, delicate or very defined detailed areas. Now, over here on the left-hand side, the second tool down, is the refine edge brush tool. I'm going to select that and make sure it is on the plus symbol not the minus so plus symbol and then you can basically brush these areas that need to be refined. This is telling Photoshop that it didn't do a good job in refining that in getting a really detailed selection and you're telling Photoshop to redo it again and so it thinks very carefully uh, through these areas and will refine that edge pretty accurately and you'll see when we're done that it does a very good job any areas that it doesn't maybe pick up you can just brush over it again and it will rethink <clears throat> but we're going to just brush through this area pretty well and um, You'll, you'll get the general idea here in a minute. The computer's thinking hard, and again, because of everything else running in the background, it's going to be a little bit slow. Um, but basically, I'm going to brush over all of this tree line area and also down into the reflection where the tree line is. I'm going to include the lily pads 
um, and Photoshop will do a very nice job of thinking its way through and selecting be and missing the little areas where the sky is peeking through. You can see it's doing a great job of that. I'm going to pause the video briefly while I complete the rest of this just for the sake of time and I'll be right back. Okay, so I finished brushing over all of the uh, foreground areas or what I would call foreground. It um, Photoshop did a really great job um, in the first pass, first couple of passes, to select the lily, the lily pads, the trees, <clears throat> all of the tree line throughout the reflection, even and the, the of course the the skyline, the horizon line, um, and it left the reflection pretty much um, alone. Uh, there are some areas here that are darker that it tried to pick up, but it left it feathered or kind of transparent so that um, the edits we do will blend very nicely. It's, it's kind of a nice way that it does it. Works very seamless. Um, but basically now we have our selection. So just click OK. There's our selection. Um, first thing I want to do is I'm going to save the selection. Go to Select, Save Selection. I'm going to name it Sky. That will save it as a new channel. So if you notice down here, now you have a selection that is a channel. I'm going to um, duplicate this layer. <clears throat> Before I do that, I'm going to go ahead and create a mask or a layer of that. It, because I did this kind of in the wrong area, I need to go in and delete this one part of the, the channel, that one channel. It created another channel. <clears throat> Ideally, you would duplicate this layer first, um, like this. Then we're going to load a selection. We'll reload that selection and we'll tell it we want the sky version that loads that selection. And then down here in the layer section at the bottom, there's this little icon, the square with the, with the hole in it, kind of a big circle in it. Add layer mask. Click that. That will turn the selection into a layer mask. So if you hold Alt and click the mask, it shows you what the mask consists of. So everything that is black, if I edit this layer, nothing in the black areas will be affected by the edits that we make. Which means if I apply any edits to this layer um, that is here, the only thing that the edits will change will be the sky. That's exactly what we want. But we also need another layer that will allow us to edit only the foreground. So by highlighting this layer right here, just click and make sure the whole thing's highlighted and you do Control J, that will duplicate the layer. Now it's identical, so the mask is the same too, but we want the exact opposite of this mask. So this is what we have, but we want it to be the opposite. If you click Control I, it will invert it or make it completely opposite of what it was. So in essence, now we have a mask that looks like this, where the sky will be protected. With any edits we make, the sky will not be affected. The other layer here, we have a mask where the foreground will be protected from any edits that we make. And it's a very nice um, you know, very accurate mask, uh, which is exactly what we wanted. Now, if for some reason Photoshop struggles with some of this, you can go in and refine that even better, and we will cover that in future tutorials. But this is exactly what we wanted it to do, <clears throat> is to create these two separate layers so that both objects, the sky and the foreground, can be edited completely separately. From this point, we'll go in and edit and refine things to make the image uh, look even better. This is a small baby step process. Uh, in order to keep things from getting out of control, you have to uh, edit things kind of in small baby steps or incrementally, otherwise you can create problems. Um, but the next steps would be to edit the sky and edit the foreground individually, separate from one another, but keeping them blending to where they look natural. And that's what we'll do in the next video. Um, thanks for watching.